Now, the latest from ITV News in the West Country with John T. Messer and Ellie Louise Ringe. Hello and welcome to Monday's programme. Coming up tonight between now and half past six. Pending and costing thousands. We hear from a pig farmer near Devizes who says the government must act now. And this is not a problem that's just appeared. It's a problem that the industry has been warning the government of for at least 18 months. And the government has repeatedly missed opportunities to do something about it. Also tonight, we're live in Yate as first bus put the brakes on many local routes. Plus, the Bristol firm that says demand for renewable energy is booming, but why not everyone might be making the switch? Celebrations as Forest Green Rovers make football history. We'll bring you a full roundup of the weekend sport. And the next few days look pretty decent. Maybe not wall to wall sunshine, but some fine and increasingly warm weather on the horizon. See you soon for the forecast. Good evening. Pig farmers are warning that they are facing a crisis as the industry struggles to recruit skilled workers and the cost of feed and energy rises to record levels. One farmer in Wiltshire has told ITV News he's losing around £5,000 every week because pigs are costing more to produce than he can sell them for and he's calling on the government for urgent support. Richard Payne reports. <laughs> Every day these pigs remain in their pen comes at a heavy cost. Just over six months old, they should have left for the abattoir by now, but a lack of skilled labour further down the production line is costing farmer Cameron Norton dearly. An awful lot of skilled staff went home after Brexit because they didn't feel welcome here, and the government hoped that they'd be able to fill these positions with British workers. They've been unable to do that, and this is not a problem that's just appeared. It's a problem that the industry has been warning the government of for at least 18 months, and the government has repeatedly missed opportunities to do something about it. Some of these animals weigh about 140 kilograms, beyond the prime weight supermarkets demand, so their value is reduced. Add to that the vast amount of food they need every day, and farmers are being hit by a double blow. Cameron says his production costs have risen from 165p a kilo late last year to 210p now. Achieving just 170p per kilo of meat, he estimates he's losing around £5,000 every week on his stock of 5,000 pigs. I've been keeping pigs for 35 years. We've lived through foot and mouth, swine dysentery, TB, all sorts of restrictions, all sorts of problems. But this is far and away the worst because we've basically been abandoned by the government and sacrificed on a political point. This is the barn where 500 tonnes of wheat to help feed the pigs who've outstayed their welcome will be stored. An unbudgeted cost, partly due to the war in Ukraine, which all adds to the bank overdraft. As we filmed, 14 tonnes of barley arrived from a neighbouring farm who's honoured a pre-arranged price of £200 a tonne. At today's level, it would be £320. So Cameron, this is where it all begins really, up here? Yes, every, every three weeks we have about 60 sows, that's mother pigs giving birth, um, which means there's roughly 600 babies being born every three weeks, which is absolutely wonderful. But if we're not able to sell bigger pigs at the other end, it doesn't take long for us to start getting a build-up of pigs. Cameron's family have rented 750 acres of the Wiltshire Downs just outside Devizes for more than 50 years. For how many more is unknown. Breeding pig numbers have been cut from 550 to 400 here and full-time staff from 10 to 7. It's placed a huge stress on myself, my wife, our staff and of course our bank managers because yeah, we have been able to look after our animals to the best of our ability. We have been able to access extra accommodation so we haven't had to overcrowd them like a lot of farmers but nonetheless it is costing us a huge amount of money to keep animals. Unsustainable costs which he predicts will cause a rapid downward spiral of RSPCA assured farms with pigs bred outdoors. 
overtaken by cheaper imported meat produced by standards Cameron says are illegal in the UK. And do you think the British public get it? Do they understand that or will they only realise when they can't buy British pork perhaps or in the quantities they have been able to? I think that they would be quite shocked to realise that our government is hindering the supply of quality British pigs and allowing imported product at the expense of British production. Production which is growing ever more expensive. The ultimate cost, say pig farmers, could be their very existence. Richard Payne, ITV News, Wiltshire. Well, for more on this, we can join our political correspondent, David Wood, in Westminster. David, this isn't the first call for more support for farmers. No, it's not, Ellie. And the government, I think, accepts that there have been difficult times for the whole farming industry, particularly the pig farming industry. But I get a sense in the government there is growing confidence that things are beginning to improve. A number of different schemes have been launched by uh, the Environment Department to specifically help pig farmers. Extra visas have been uh, offered over the past few months to try and address the shortage in butchers. There are also uh, special financial incentives being offered to abattoirs to help uh, slaughter more pigs to try and clear some of those backlogs. But in the longer term, the government wants to show that it's doing more to help the industry, more to help farming in general. But quite often, pig farmers can get a raw deal when they're selling some of their produce. And the Environment Secretary has told us that is something he wants to change. There are four really big players uh, in the pig processing sector. And what we've seen during this difficult year is some of those contracts uh, aren't really working fairly. Um, some of the obligations on, on pig farmers aren't reciprocated by corresponding obligations in the other direction. And we're going to use powers under the Agriculture Act uh, to make some changes and have some new statutory requirements for the way those contracts should work to ensure that there's fairer dealing in future. And of course, farmers and their businesses are being impacted by the wider cost of living prices for pretty much everything are going up at the moment. The government uh, says behind the scenes a lot of work is going on to change that and particularly impacting farming industry. A lot of grain comes through Ukraine. Of course, the conflict there is adding to prices too. OK, David Wood, live in Westminster. Thank you. Elsewhere in the region today, there were long queues on the M5 in Somerset earlier after a cider lorry caught fire near Clevedon. Happened on the northbound carriageway near Junction 20 at lunchtime, destroying the lorry and 50 kegs of alcohol. There were reports of loud bangs as barrels exploded. Highways England said at one point there were tailbacks of almost nine miles. Royal sewage was released into Gloucestershire's rivers more than 5,000 times last year. The figures from the Rivers Trust show the Forest of Dean fed worst, with the Cotswolds and Tewkesbury not far behind. The practice is only supposed to be used in emergency situations, but was carried out every single day in 2021. Now, the bus operator First West of England has brought in major changes to services in Bristol, Somerset and South Gloucestershire. Six routes have been permanently scrapped and tens of others have been reduced or rerouted, leaving many people wondering how they'll get around. Well, Karen Bell is live in Yate for us this evening, which has lost one of its services. Karen, can you give us some more detail on these changes? Yes, well, Ellie, that service that's gone is Y2, which ran from Chipping Sodbury through Yate and Down End into Bristol. Also scrapped is T2 between Thornbury and Bristol. And then over in Western Supermare, routes 2, 4, 5 and 6 have gone as well. And in addition to those scrappings, there is also a very long list of bus services which have either had their frequencies reduced or have been rerouted to an extent. So potentially a lot of inconvenience for many people. Oh, well, a lot of people rely on it, a lot of older people, a lot of younger people. Uh, there's a lot of activities going on that way and a lot of people live out that way that don't have transport, single parents. Um, it's affecting a lot of people. I don't really know how they're coping on that side. I look at buses as they go by me and there's only two or three people on the, deck, on the bottom deck and nobody upstairs at all. So I wonder how they can possibly keep them running. Uh, with so few passengers. Well, I think it's a mistake. They should continue the services. That, I mean, I used to use, before I had an injury, um, the Y2 um, service to get in and out of town. Um, and it's, well, it's easy. And we've got a whole bus stop here. 
Now, operator First Bus is blaming driver shortages and, as you heard a gentleman mention there, falling passenger numbers. And First says that some of that reduction in passengers predates the pandemic. But anyway, they say the result of all this is that some services are now commercially un viable. We put this to Dan Norris, who is the West of England Metro Mayor, who has oversight of the transport system in the region. And here was his suggestion for the problem. I would say to everybody watching now, please go and use the buses, the trains, walk and cycle, because the sooner we get on with that, the sooner we get back to a proper normality and we all benefit from that. Uh, and then we won't have First Bus or any other bus company announcing things going backwards because they'll be getting the revenues in and they'll be able to get even more additional bus services on the road. Now, first is saying that some of these changes are temporary, others are permanent, but they haven't said which are permanent and which are temporary. But if you rely on buses and you think you know the timetable down to the minute, do have a look, because there could well have been changes. OK, Karen Bell, live in the eight. Thank you. Just gone 11 minutes past six. Thanks for your company this evening. Stay with us until half past six. There's more to come, including the Bristol Flyers, who have slammed their way to the best ever position in the BBL. But it wasn't the only success in the West Country. Of course, we'll have a full round of the weekend sport. And Charlie's at the Met Office. Charlie, it was a pretty nice weekend, wasn't it? Yeah, gorgeous. We've got high pressure overhead. It looks like it's going to last towards the next bank holiday weekend. So join me later for that forecast detail. And after us, the ITV News will continue with the national and international stories. Mary Nightingale has the details. Coming up on the programme, four people are stabbed to death at a house in South London. Police describe the attack as deeply shocking. A man in his 20s has been arrested on suspicion of murder. We will have the latest. Too little, too late. The government steps in to help with shortages of HRT, but only after women have gone to desperate lengths to get it. A special report into the shocking rise in children being groomed and abused online. And... I've come into possession of a villa in the south of France. And we catch up with the cast of Downton Abbey as the show heads abroad and into a new era. Would you like me for those stories and more at 6.30? But first, with utility bills hitting record highs, thousands across our region are already looking to capitalise on the government's move to scrap VAT on household energy efficiency measures. Online searches for things like solar panels jumped by two-thirds since the spring statement announcement at the end of last month. But industry experts say it doesn't make greener technology truly affordable, as Nick Smith has been hearing. Britain currently has the oldest housing stock in Europe. More than 12 million homes built before the Second World War, which left untouched are notorious for high energy costs and a high carbon footprint. But it is possible to retrofit them so they're much more efficient. This 150-year-old terraced property has gone the whole hog. With an air-to-air -air heat pump, solar thermal panels for warming water and insulation, which had to be installed on top of the existing internal walls. It overhangs, so you can see from my hand that it's, it's overlapping that much. So I lost that much space. For Rose Lewis, who lives here, she says overall it was worthwhile, but all the work came at a considerable cost. It was not easy. Um, I didn't realise quite how disruptive it would be. Um, and it is possible that had I known, I wouldn't have done it. But having done it, I am so pleased, I'm so glad. It probably won't reduce my bills because of the price going up so much, but I don't think I'm going to have to pay more. Renewable energy products have recently received a nice discount, as the Chancellor used his spring statement to call on homeowners to join the push to cut the reliance on fossil fuels. So I can announce for the next five years, homeowners having materials like solar panels, heat pumps or insulation installed will no longer pay 5% VAT, they will pay zero. A month on from that announcement and Google search data shows interest in solar panels, for instance, has jumped by two thirds. For firms which install things like heat pumps in households across the West Country, like Bristol-based Pink Energy, it's brought on a noticeable uptick in orders. 
since the VAT has been scrapped, uh, it's been great really. It's, it's, it's made a difference for people who are maybe on the fence about making the switch to a renewable heating system or solar panels. Um, it's given them the financial backing they need um, and it's given them that assurance that the government is you know, supportive of, of this scheme. It's also raised awareness. Um, a lot of people hadn't heard about these renewable systems um, and, and give people again that assurance that these systems are here to last. While the VAT cut has been labelled a welcome start by sustainable energy experts, the cost of installation still remains far out of reach for many homeowners. We need to have a higher uh, sort of incentives to allow people to go forward with implementing solar panels and heat pumps in their housing. Cutting VAT will not do that because the cost is very high, 20000 for example for a typical heat pump and also about 8000 for solar panels. Heat is so important for us in the UK, about 20% of our emissions attacking that high percentage are refurbishing buildings and by having heat pumps, so going away from gas into electricity is very, very important. Well, the government says it has committed £6.6 .6 billion into improving energy efficiency, but there are still serious questions over whether that will be enough to turn millions of our older properties into homes fit for a greener future. Nick Smith, ITV News. Well, we saw in that report some rather expensive ways of saving energy with heat pumps and solar panels. But what about things we can all do that won't break the bank or require a full home makeover? Well, earlier we spoke to Stu Horn from the Energy Saving Trust, who gave us some useful tips and advice. So at Energy Saving Trust, we've been looking at short and swift um, actions that any household can take that will help to reduce their energy bill. Uh, and typically for, a, for an average three bedroom household, the things that we've been thinking of, um, although they're small actions, when you combine them together, they could save up to 200 pounds um, off, off a bill uh, per year. So what, what, what would you say are your top three tips for us all to save money? Okay, so the, um, the, 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 our number one tip is to go around the house and look at the, all the devices that are on standby and to turn those off. Uh, because although they're on standby, they're still using energy. And actually combining all of those things together in an average three bedroom home could save around 55 pounds a year. Uh, and then secondly, um, to use a bit less water in the household. So um, swapping out one bath for a shower every week um, and to have one fewer bath or shower every week, that could save 35 pounds per person per year. And then also if you use your appliances in a slightly different way. So if you, um, when you put the washing machine on, if you put it on at 30 degrees and you try and do one fewer wash per week, and when you put the dishwasher on, if you make sure it's always full and you put it on one less time a week, um, that would save you up to 28 pounds a year. And Stu, you've given some great advice there. Out of all the energy saving measures out there, what do you think is the best value for money while saving the most energy? Mm. Well, so, so I talked a bit about things that people could do now that don't cost any money, but with a little bit of investment and thinking about the winter that's, that's coming up, off, you know, going to be quite soon after the summer, um, the most effective people, thing that people can do is to draft proof their homes. Um, you can pay a professional to do that. So for a three bedroom family home, that should cost around typically £240, but it would save £95 at today's prices. Uh, per year and it will save that every year. Um, actually you can do quite a lot of the draft proofing yourself with materials that you can pick up at a DIY store and um, that means going around the home and finding the gaps between the windows and the window frame, the doors and the door frame, using material strips to fill those gaps or, or, or foam to fill the gaps um, and you can um, draft proof uh, the keyhole and uh, letterbox on the door as well. All of those things together, those will stop cold drafts coming in that will keep your heating requirements down, that will lower your bills. Um, another thing that people can do is if you've got a chimney, you can get a chimney excluder for about £20 and just, just doing that alone will save about £65 off your bill every year. Okay, some really, really good advice there. Stu Horn, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. And it's time for sport now and we've got history makers over the weekend and we're not talking about Forest Green. Small businesses and local teams, the heart of our communities. eBay sponsors ITV Regional Sport Reports. And Sam is here to take us through all it. We are actually going to start with Forest Green, aren't we? Because, of course, they have been promoted to League One. 
you can't start anywhere else, can you, John? I mean, what a great day for them. We've covered them over the years, all their environmental stuff, but it's worth just saying now, they are just a really good team in their own right. I mean, two years time, uh, in, in a year's time, Forest Green Rovers will be just two tiers off the Premiership. Just think about that. And, you know, it wasn't easy for them, but it wasn't easy for, for, for Bristol Rovers either. They drew nil-nil with them, of course, and Bristol Rovers are in the hunt for the top three themselves. Swindon also very much in the mix. They kept their very slim playoff chances alive with a good win. They've really missed top scorer Harry McCurdy, haven't they, with his injury recently. But he's back now and he showed why they've missed him at Hartlepool with two goals. So there are just so many permutations and possibilities for the end of the season. Let's have a look at the table because Forest Green, they need to stay strong to try and clinch that title. Exeter snapping at their heels. Bristol Rovers are just two points off automatic promotion and Swindon, as I said, they're just two points off the playoffs themselves. And the fact that those teams have been doing so well is really reflected in the sort of League Two team of the season. We've got five players, as you can see in there, and Rob Edwards, the Forest Green manager, is in there as well. So a big final weekend in League Two. What about the other region sides? Well, in the Championship, Bristol City, they didn't have a great season so far, have they? But they're starting to sort of turn things around a bit. Back to back away wins now after a 3-1 win at Derby, who are, of course, already relegated. Andy Vyman, it was, he scored first goal. He, he sort of 20 goals this season already for him. It's the most prolific season late in his career. Antoine Semenyo and Tim Closer were also on target. So signs of hope for them. And in League One, Cheltenham lost 2-1 at home to Bolton. But despite that defeat and dropping to 15th, they're guaranteed their highest ever finish in the Football League. Absolutely magnificent for Michael Duff's side. Aaron Ramsey it was who scored for them. And can't forget the National League as well. About four or five games left for there. Yeovil had a really good win on the weekend. They beat top of the league Stockport 2-1. But Weymouth, they were already facing a mountain to stay up before they lost again on the weekend. So struggling continues for them. Let's look back at the rugby now. I watched the match on the late shift on Friday. Bristol glossed it. It was such a good game, wasn't it? Outstanding. Just so end-to-end, -end, wasn't it, Ellie? I mean... Bristol take a 17-0 lead, then Gloucester come back and leading at half-time, then the Bears come back to win it late on. I mean, it does leave Gloucester just outside the top four. They're a point behind the top four. Bath also lost after being in front of the weekend as well, so not an ideal weekend for them either. OK, that's all taken care of. Let's move on to Formula One. Lando Norris had some success over the weekend. Oh, John, his first podium of the season. He was so happy and he really thanked his teammates at, at McLaren. He said that it was all their teamwork that kind of got things together. He was speaking to Phil and Holly on this morning and said it was pretty much all that that allowed him to turn it around after such a tough start to the season. Already over the last you know, three weeks and since the first race, so in race two and three, we saw some steps forward. And a bit of that is obviously... Um, uh, an effect of, of me, you know, I'm the one driving the car, I'm the one saying the car needs to be better here and in this area and so on. And they've been tweaking things and making the car quicker, basically. Mm. And, and that's been been showing and uh, I guess probably showed most of all this weekend. And before we let you go, Sam, we don't often get them on, on the news, do we? But it's important to talk about netball sides and basketball sides as well. Believe it or not, Chauncey, there was another West Country derby in sport, Team Bath and Seven Stars. And Team Bath came out on top this time, 50-40. And we all, Team Bath still need to beat Mavericks on Friday if they're to secure a semi-final spot. So even more drama for them. And in the, in the basketball, as you say, Bristol Flyers, they finished in the top four of the BBL for the first time ever. Congratulations to them. They now face Manchester Giants on Thursday and Saturday in their two legs of their quarterfinal. And that's your sport. Busy weekend, wasn't it? We look forward to more. Thanks. And the sporting theme continues. Tonight sees the start of the World Indoor Bowls Championships. It's being held for the first time in Bristol. Yes, 64 star players from 29 countries are competing, all bidding to win world titles. Katie Rowlett is live there for us tonight. Katie, how's it looking there? <laughs> Well, it's tense, Ellie, I can tell you, which is why I'm using this really quiet voice, because we're right next to the bowling green, and if I speak any louder, we risk putting the players off. But would you believe it, there are 181 games expected to be played here over the next five days. The men's and women's singles have been going on this afternoon, and the next person up on the green is former world champion Alison Merrin, who's from the Channel Islands. Alison, hello. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. Well, I'm ready to go on. I'm looking forward to it. It's a great tournament. Are you expecting to be able to hold your title? I'm hoping to. Obviously, it's going to be a tough opposition. There's 29 countries here, so it's, uh, it should be uh, hopefully a good way forward. Alison, we wish you the very best of luck. Let's introduce you now to um, Peter Thompson, who is the chief executive of the English Indoor Bowling Association. Peter, a great get for Bristol to be able to host these world championships. Oh, it's a huge to showcase uh, indoor bowls in Bristol to actually host the first ever 
combined world championships is great and the members here have been brilliant and hopefully the um, population can come down and watch it and um, experience Bolton and come back. How can people come and watch it if they want to? It's very simple. We have tickets on the door, so come along to the indoor bowls club here in uh, Ashton and purchase five pounds and you can watch a full day of bowls, six sessions, and um, you'll be well and truly entertained. Very quickly, who's winning at the moment? Can you tell us? It's a bit hard. We've only just started the first rounds of the round robin, so perhaps probably by the end of tomorrow we'll start to see um, some favourites emerging in the groups. Peter, thank you very much for speaking to us this evening. Um, yeah, like I said, 181 games due to be played here over the next five days. We won't know who the winner will be until Friday morning. And the next year's event is due to be hosted in the Southern Hemisphere. But as yet, we don't know where the location will be. But best of luck to all those players that are taking part. OK, Katie Rowlett, thank you very much indeed. I'm not sure if Katie's staying for all 181 of the games, but good luck to her if she is. It's going to be fun. Uh, weather time now. Charlie's at the Met Office for us this evening. Charlie, what a lovely weekend we've had. And you sort of hinted earlier in the programme this nice weather might hang around for a little longer. Yeah, it looks like it. It was a gorgeous weekend, wasn't it? Nice high temperatures. Today, we got off to a fine start. We saw a little bit of cloud developing as we head through the few hours, and then one or two showers just started to develop and work their way through. They're sporadic. They were really light. There's still a couple out there right now, but you'd be unlucky if you saw any rainfall. Uh, but yeah, some really fine weather to start the week. Our camera's out at Goblin Coombe, not too far from Bristol Airport, a stunning little woodland. And I thought I had some decent bluebells towards the end of that last week. These are a league above, aren't they? A nice bit of uh, dappled sunshine just really starts to set them off and you can see that lovely blue haze almost as far as the eye can see. Pretty warm as well. Armands be up to 15 Celsius today, so not quite as warm as the weekend, but the winds are a bit lighter, so on balance it still felt pretty decent. And the reason for it is because high pressure is with us. We fast forward to the end of the week here because that high pressure sticks around into at least the start of the next bank holiday weekend. It does eventually come up against an area of low pressure and it's this battle we're going to watch closely as we head through the next few days. If that high pressure holds on, we could have two back-to-back -back bank holidays with some fine conditions. Feels like home, whatever the weather. Valent Boilers and Heat Pumps, sponsors ITV West Country Weather. So some pretty fine weather really for the rest of this. We've had a couple of showers around today. They'll fade away as we head into this evening. Otherwise, we've got high pressure with some pretty dry, fine and increasingly warm weather as we head through the rest of this week. Despite an area of low pressure being closed by, that's what's brought the kind of risk of one or two showers today. That gets squeezed out as high pressure works its way southwards to become established right over the UK. So yeah, a good few fine days of weather ahead. Any remaining showers will fade away as we head into this evening. So the skies will be dry and clear and we've got light winds. So temperatures will drop down maybe to three or four Celsius, even in built up areas in the countryside. Might get a couple of degrees lower than those values you can see on screen. So maybe a patchy frost, but really a little bit of mistiness is probably the only thing we're really going to worry about first thing on Tuesday. Otherwise, a fine start, plenty of lovely sunshine right the way through the morning, and some of us will hold on to sunshine well into the afternoon. But we're going to see a little bit of fair weather, sort of cumulus cloud developing as we head into the afternoon. Don't think it's going to bring much in the way of showers, but with some light winds and temperatures again around 15 Celsius, it will feel quite warm in that sunshine. And it'll just probably get warmer still as we head to the rest of this week. Temperatures increasing a little bit each day up to maybe 16 or 17 degrees by Friday. Quite a bit of sunshine by then as well. We might still have one or two chilly nights. Something to bear in mind for you gardeners and growers out there. Now you know how much I love a reflection. Deborah out at Western Super Mare with some incredibly still waters in some of the fine weather we have had over the past few days. That's almost perfect, isn't it? Keep those photos coming on through West Country Weather at ITV.com. Valent. Sponsors ITV West Country Weather. Sounds good. Charlie, thank you. Uh, that is it from all of us on the programme. I'm back. I'm bringing the late news at half past ten. After the break, the ITV News continues with Mary Nightingale from all of us here. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.